Good morning, happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. Hope you're having a safe Sunday, safe week in this troubled of times and world. And uh, today we will continue in the Gospel of John. We are in chapter three. But before then, uh, we are Restoration Fellowship. That's the name of this ministry founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. This is our homepage, our website focus on the kingdom.org if you'd like to know about us uh, just go to the links and you can see uh, beliefs many articles books from anthony and others and if you're on the live stream church site uh, that's the link there as well we have many other sites uh, we have a podcast that by the way i've just uploaded the jesus was not a trinitarian book from Sir Anthony. You can listen to it. You can download it on our podcast page. As you can see, all 12 chapters and two appendices. There you go. You can also listen to the coming Kingdom of the Messiah booklet or book from Anthony as well there. So you can access that as well. So this morning we have a youth lesson from Michelle on Samson, the story of Samson. And uh, and before then though, as usual, we will open with prayer this Sunday. So today is February 27, 2022. And uh, some of you know, war has broken out again in Europe. Uh, Russia invaded Ukraine this last week. So uh, when we open with prayers, please remember our brothers and sisters there in those regions, especially Maxim. As you know, Tracy from KOG Missions has been working with Maxim and others. We pray for people there in the Ukraine as well. We know a group there of young men. <clears throat> so these are hard times difficult times we're, we're just finishing hopefully a pandemic the latest pandemic to grip the world and now we're plunged into war and god forbid another world war so prayers for everyone out there all right so let me open with prayer and uh, as, as you see there on the screen, this is the Shema, the first and greatest of all the commandments. Listen, Israel, the Lord, our God is one person or one Lord. And this is the prayer we start with this morning. So Father, we come to you <clears throat> with a sad heart. During these times, uh, people still battling this pandemic and now wars breaking out. We pray that your kingdom may come soon, Father, that uh, things that prophecy says have to happen before you send your son are fulfilled and we are liberated from the present evil age to start the uh, Messianic king kingdom age. We pray for those less fortunate than us, Father, those battling uh, this uh, sickness, this pandemic, and those brothers and sisters in those war-torn countries. We pray, Father, for uh, Maxime and others there, or for Tracy's ministry with, with Russia. Uh, we pray for our own church here, the Coxes, the Warrens, a reminder of uh, Linwood surgery coming up as well. We thank the listeners, Father, and that they may be blessed and edified through these teachings that we do in for your name and your glory. And we uh, pray all these things in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Uh, before we start, let me share a, a scripture here. I've been reading the last the last week. And this psalm came to mind, Psalm 74. 
Oh God, why have you rejected us so long? Why is your anger so intense against the sheep of your own pasture? Remember that we are the people you chose long ago. The tribe you redeemed us, your own special possession. And remember Jerusalem, your home here on earth. Walk through the awful ru ruins of the city. See how the enemy has destroyed your sanctuary. And then the psalmist, uh, talks about the enemies uh, that surround the people of God. And I'd like to move forward here in verse 9. They say, we no longer see your miraculous signs. All the prophets are gone. No one can tell us when it will end. How long, O oh God, will you allow our enemies to insult you? Will you let them dishonor your name forever? Why do you hold back your strong right hand? Unleash your powerful fist and destroy them. Um, I think we can still pray this prayer, and we do in a way, whenever we, we pray, may your kingdom come. Because according to the prophecy, when the kingdom of God comes, there will be a lot of destruction, a lot of weeping, gnashing of teeth. If you read the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 7, you will see how the nations of this present evil age, the governments, will be destroyed. Many people, most people, will perish, says the prophet. Uh, but nonetheless, we must preach this kingdom that is coming. It will be a terrible and devastating day for this world, but these things must happen in order for God to establish the true order and peace that will never end. So we pray uh, with the psalmist there, and we always think about these things as life gets tougher and harder. All right, thank you. And um, let's see. So now we'll do the youth lesson and then followed uh with Sir Anthony and he's continuing reading. And again, we're in the Gospel of John chapter three, but here is Michelle to talk to us about Samson. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning to all our young folks out there and uh, our old folks also, and, and anybody in between. Uh, yes, I'm gonna talk to you today about the story of Samson. In the days after the Israelites left Egypt, remember they entered the promised land. And after several years, you know, they had babies and more children were born. And after a while, they actually forgot about God, which I think is, to me, is kind of hard to believe because God had done so much for them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And you think that they would honor that and honor God, but they didn't. And so they turned to worshiping the gods of the Canaanites who were in the land where they were and they had worshiped idols and really turned away from the one God that brought them, delivered them out of Egypt. They didn't have a king or a leader specifically, and they had what was called judges. God set it up that way so that um, the judges would help settle disputes and kind of like a governor or the tribal leaders, they said. They, they all kind of had a little army, a little military with them too. And the Bible said, though, that there was no king in those days and that every man did what was right in his own eyes. So there was a lot of lawlessness, too. And a lot of the people just did evil things. I mean, they just sinned and they did evil things. And God got kind of tired of it. And so he let their land be taken over by these bad guys called the Philistines. And the Philistines didn't worship God. They worshiped idols. They had a... a a god they called Dagon, who was their, their big god. And they mistreated the Israelites and just um, really were, you know, bad toward them. And God thought that that would teach his people a lesson if they were taken over for a while for, uh, by these other people. And so he decided after 40 years, though, that he would rescue the Israelites from being ruled by the Philistines. And he had a plan to do that. And his plan was to raise up a man who would be kind of like a savior to help start delivering them from the Philistines. So we find this story in the book of Judges, chapter 13 through 16. 
And we don't have time now to read through that whole story, but maybe you can do it later yourselves. And I'm going to warn you, it's very bloody. It's very violent. A lot of it's just really disturbing stuff. But Judges 13, 1, as I said earlier, the, oh wait, that's not what I said earlier. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Then it goes on to tell us God's plan. The angel of the Lord came to an Israelite woman who was unable to have children. And the angel spoke for God and told her that she was going to have a baby, a son, and that he will begin to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. And this boy was going to be very special. He had three conditions that he had would have to live by, and his parents would have to make sure that he lived by these. And it was called what was being a Nazarite. And uh, the three conditions were he was not allowed to drink any alcoholic beverages, no wine, not even vinegar, nothing even grapes, no raisins even. Just nothing that had to do with, with grapes, um, especially wine. And even his mother was not allowed to have any of that while she was pregnant with him, which I thought was kind of interesting. Number two, he was not allowed to cut his hair or shave his head his entire life, not when he was a little kid, not when he was a grown-up. So I imagine by the time he was an adult, he had really long hair. And number three, he was not allowed to get near anything that was considered unclean or dead. And so that's how a Nazarite, usually Nazarites would do that for a short time of their lives just to to get more dedicated to, to God, to the, to being living a holy life. But for Samson, he was a little bit different. He, this was his whole lifestyle. So everything the angel predicted came to pass. They named the baby Samson. He was the strongest man in the Bible. And maybe, maybe even the strongest man who ever lived. Think Incredible Hulk strong. Superman strong. Because God's spirit would enter Samson and he was able to do things that normal men could not do. One time he was leaving a city when some bad guys were trying to capture him. And on his way out, he tore up the huge posts, the gate of the city with these huge pillars that held it up. And he carried the whole thing up on, on his shoulders and carried it uphill. The thing must have weighed thousands of pounds. And uh, obviously the bad guys didn't bother him because they were kind of impressed and scared probably. And another time he took, uh, he killed a lion with his bare hands. Another time he took the jawbone of a donkey. So he took this bone that was kind of curved, you know, and he killed 1,000 of the Philistines all by himself. And he didn't have an army like a lot of the judges had. He just did this by himself. Samson understood that his amazing strength came from God. And he tried to obey God. He tried, but sometimes he just fell short. If you read the whole story in Judges, you will see things that he did that were not really the way to act, not really obeying God. But God loved Samson, and he loved his people, and he kept to his plan for Samson to start the process of delivering the people from the Philistines, just as he said he would. Samson was one of the judges. He was made one of the judges who ruled the area for 20 years. So he must have done some things right. They just don't tell you all about that time too much. But let's go to the story of Samson and Delilah. You've probably heard of them. Delilah was a Philistine woman, and Samson fell in love with her. They were most likely married, although the Bible doesn't mention them getting married, but they lived as a husband and wife. The Philistine leaders wanted to capture Samson and stop him from fighting against them, so they came up with a plan. They told Delilah that they would pay her tons of money if she would find out the secret to Samson's strength. It was so much money that she would be very, very rich, and so she agreed. She asked Samson over and over what the secret to his strength was. He knew that he shouldn't tell her, especially since her family was his enemy. So he decided to kind of tell her a little story and a little bit of a lie. And let's go ahead and look at the story and we'll read it, starting in Judges 16, verse 7. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak and be like any other man. So we're talking about tying him up with these, these cords. 
Then the governors of the Philistines brought her seven fresh animal tendons. I guess that's what they used for a cord in those days. That had not been dried, and she bound him with them. She tied him up. Now she had men prepared for an ambush in an inner room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke up, tore the tendons to pieces, just like a thread of flax is torn apart when it comes too close to a fire. So his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have toyed with me and told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. Then he said to her, for him, I think he was kind of toying with her too, like whatever. If they bind me tightly with new ropes, which have not been used, then I will become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him up with them. And she said to them, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But the men, for the men in the ambush were waiting in the inner room to come and get him. But he tore the ropes from his arms like a thread. He just popped right out of them. Then one more other time, I'm not going to read that, but Delilah bugged him again to tell his secret. And he told her a lie and they did another thing. And then she called the Philistines to come again. And he easily broke free from that. Now, I would be questioning at this time just kind of how much uh, this lady really loved me, Samson. Come on, man. But she kept bugging him for days. She said, how can you say you love me if you won't tell me your secret? I can just hear this conversation. So let's go back to verse 16. It says, it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. I just think that's kind of amazing. I can picture that happening. So he told her, Finally, he told her his secret. A razor has never come on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my birth. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. So, she to he, told him, he told her his secret. What do you think happened next? I think that was a big mistake, wasn't it? So she called those Philistine leaders and she told them, bring me all that money you promised me because I'm pretty sure he's told me, or no, I'm very sure he's told me the truth this time. During the night, she was being lovey-dovey and kind of had him going to sleep on her lap. And he fell asleep kind of with his head in her lap. And he wore his hair in seven braids. You can imagine if he had really, really long hair, um, women do this. They braid their hair at night when they sleep so it won't get all tangled. So it said he had seven braids. And Delilah called in a servant quietly and had her servant come and shave off each of those braids of his head so that he had no more hair. When he woke up, and then she called the Philistines in, hey, Philistines, come on in. And they came in to capture him. And when he woke up, he thought he could just jump up and defeat them like before because he didn't realize at first that he was bald and that God had left him. So the Philistines seized him. They took him away. They put out his eyes so he was blind. They put chains around him and they put, them, put him in prison. They made him walk around pushing a large, uh, these poles that push a grinding stone, you know, all day in prison. Usually they would use four donkeys or, or, or ponies to push this thing around. But instead they had Samson doing that and probably by himself. And because he didn't have God's super strength anymore, it was probably really hard for him to do. Plus he couldn't see. But after a while, his hair started to grow back. And wouldn't you think the Philistines would realize this and just keep trimming his hair? But I guess they weren't really that bright, but I'm glad. So the Philistine leaders one time were having a huge celebration to honor their pagan god Dagon, and they decided to bring Samson in to make fun of him. And let's pick up the story starting in Judges 16, verse 23. It says, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. It so happened when they were in high spirits that they said, call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they called Samson from the prison 
and he made sport before them. I imagine they were saying things like, hey, Samson, lift this up and pick that up and do stuff. And of course, he couldn't even see, so there's no telling what they were what they were doing. They were laughing at him, making fun of him. They made him stand between the pillars. Now, I think he probably stood between the two pillars in the temple so he would be right in the middle where everybody could see him. Verse 26 says, Then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean on them. So the boy did that. And now the house was filled full of men and women, and all the lords who were the leaders were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this one more time, O oh God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my eyes. He wanted to get back at them for putting out his eyes, but also I think he wanted to show them God's power one more time. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his whole life. And that must have been just an amazing thing for him to push on the pillars of that temple that were really tall and big and have that whole thing come crashing down. So we see that Samson turned to God to give him supernatural strength one more time to accomplish God's purpose, not just his own this time. Well, not just this time, but God loved Samson enough to give him his strength back, even though he had been arrogant and he'd been violent and disobedient and he had abused the, abused the incredible gift that God had given him several times. God forgave him but he allowed Samson to die probably because he had done so many wrong things. But this final act of strength would allow Samson to bring glory to God. Samson did fulfill God's promise about him that he would get ready, ready, get rid of many of the Philistines who were ruling over Israel. All their leaders were killed that day in the collapsed temple. So imagine their whole land was in a lot of confusion because all their leaders now were dead. He's listed in Hebrews 11 verse 32 as one of the mighty heroes of faith of the Old Testament. We can learn from this that in spite of things we've done that are sinful and lead us away from God, it is never too late to humble ourselves and return to God's loving arms. Wow, thank you. Michelle for reminding us of the great story of Samson, a tragic figure to be sure, but also a messianic figure, yet another type of the Messiah to come. If you read the uh, story of Samson's birth, by the way, if you, if you put them uh, uh, parallel with the story of the virgin birth of Jesus, it's quite interesting, the parallels. Okay, so let's see. So that was Samson, the youth lesson. Hope you enjoy it. So before we go to Anthony and uh, continue his reading of the Gospel of John, again, we're in chapter 3, verse 16. I have a, I have a sermonette as usual. So I've done uh, around 10 debates, uh, mostly on the Trinity, whether the one God of Israel is one person or three persons, as, as the Trinity teaches. So I'd like to share uh, some of the things I've learned over the years now debating, and I hope this will help you in uh, talking to people, not just in a debate format, but simply uh, telling people about the one God, the Father, that we believe is the only true God as Jesus believes. So. I hope you can uh, be edified with this teaching. And uh, it's on the singular personal pronouns in the Bible. The Trinity God is defined as three persons in one being or essence. Hence, 
the formulation three who's, one what, is used by some Trinitarians, highlighting the impersonal nature, one what, of the Trinity God as a whole. This has been the standard, classic, historical orthodox position for hundreds of years. But modern day apologists argue that singular personal pronouns such as I, me, him, his, etc., can be used for all three persons of the Trinity at the same time. For example, they claim that in Bible verses like Isaiah 44, verse 24, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. The singular personal pronoun I and myself can refer to the Trinity, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons. As apologist James White puts it in his book, The Forgotten Trinity, the Father is identified as Yahweh, but I believe that the Bible identifies Jesus as Yahweh as well, and the Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh. Each of these three persons shares the one divine name, Yahweh. Yet, in the same book, White also says, I believe the name Yahweh refers to the very divine being, the eternal God, who created everything. The noted evangelical Carl Henry warns his fellow Trinitarians not to fall into this clear contradiction. In his book, God, Revelation, and Authority, Volume 5, Carl Henry writes that some critics consider orthodox representations of the Trinity a mathematical monstrosity. Doctrine, they contend, is as fallacious in its claim for the three-in-one God as is the formula 3x equals 1x. But this description patently distorts the doctrine. Christian theology affirms neither that three gods are one God, nor that three isolated persons are one God. Rather, it affirms three eternal personal distinctions in the one God, in short, 3x in one y. Such a formulation is both intelligible and non-contradictory. The fact is, as another noted evangelical, Dr. Millard Erickson admitted, many self-professed Christians simply do not know what the doctrine of the Trinity says. And the truth is, no one can. That's because the architects of the Trinity, the so-called Cappadocian Fathers, and later the so-called Saint Augustine and Aquinas, created what I call a slippery fish of a doctrine that requires its defenders to constantly move the goalposts, becoming moving targets. John Biddle, the so-called father of English Unitarianism, was right to accuse Trinitarians of adding yet more absurdities, that there are three persons who are severally and each of them true God, and yet there is but one true God. This is an error in counting or numbering which, when argued, is of all others the most brutal and inexcusable. And if you cannot understand it, you cannot be a person. Later, Joseph Priestley added, it must be universally true that three things to which the same definition applies can never make only one thing to which the same definition applies. If, therefore, the three persons are each of them perfect God, they must still be three gods. And to say that there are only one God is as much a contradiction as to say that three men are not three men, but only one man. And the little known English Unitarian preacher, Lant Carpenter said it best, if God is tripersonal, it cannot be said to be a person. You introduce nothing but confusion, for God is always described by the sacred writers as a person. When you speak of God being an intelligent agent and at the same time deny him to be a person, you talk in a language not possible to be understood. Again, whether the terms essence and substance have the same signification or different things, I think of little importance and not worth a particular discussion. It is high time that all such metaphysical terms should be banished from Christian professions 
and Christian debates. I hope uh, you find that helpful in your conversations with uh, those self-professed people who believe the one God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of course, Jesus, is actually three persons, not one person. So, all right, uh, we'll go now to the main sermon with Anthony. Again, we're in the Gospel of John chapter three, the famous John 3.16, actually, we're starting today, finishing the chapter. If you'd like to follow with Anthony's translation commentary, onegodtranslation.com, as you see, onegodtranslation.com. There are the New Testament books. This is only the New Testament. By the way, um, uh, we're often asked if Anthony will do an, an Old Testament translation and commentary. Well, if God would uh, gift us with a hundred more years, maybe, <laughs> of life, uh, we might be able to, but no. Uh, so, but we appreciate your uh, interest. John 3.16, if you have any questions for Anthony, again, please keep them to the main sermon at hand, which is the Gospel of John. If you have any questions for Anthony, please type them in all caps in the chat. Okay, Anthony? If you're ready, thank you so right. much. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you for that uh, good introduction. We are, uh, as Carlos was telling you, what we call biblical Unitarians. That's to say we do not believe that God is three persons. We simply think that if Jesus is called God, and the Father is called God, and the Holy Spirit is called God, your child of two understands that, to mean that there are three gods, and that's impossible. So we rely heavily on the Shema, the Hear, O Israel, of Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Mark 12, um, where Jesus recites this. If you want to be a Christian, as I'll try to point out to you from John 3, particularly now, you're supposed to follow Jesus. That would not seem to me even to be needed to be stated, but alas, it is. We've lost track of the fact that following Christ means following his teachings. So there's all sorts of muddle and confusion around by which people say, well, I believe in the person of Jesus, but I don't believe in his teachings. Such people, I think, need to learn their own English language. So we're going to stress, as we read uh, the rest of John 3 here, that Jesus is intent upon getting you to believe what Jesus believed, to teach what Jesus taught, and therefore to teach the same gospel of the kingdom as Jesus always taught. And it may be a bit of a rude awakening for you, but I want you to think about this deeply. The people who traipse into church this morning go in thinking vaguely that God is three persons in one God. And they walk out of church with the same vague idea that he's somehow three persons. It's very unlikely that they've been corrected gently to believe as Jesus believed it. So here you have the bizarre situation of millions of human beings not actually bothering to find out what Jesus said about who God is. Now we come then to John chapter 3 verse 16. This is one of those fundamentally important verses that is used by the Billy Graham people, we might call them. And it is quite clearly one of John's wonderful reports of the words of Jesus. So it goes like this. In John 3.16, God so loved the world. I just point out that the so loved the world isn't necessarily quite as you might hear it in English that he adored the word so much or the world so much. It simply means, in a more matter-of-fact way, God loved the world in the following manner. Very prosaic, if you like. The meaning is unaltered. It's still a wonderful, wonderful statement. So God loved the world in an all-embracing way, we might say. He loves his creation. And you think that if you created the whole world and all the amazing things we see in it, that he would indeed love that world. 
and especially the crown of his creation, which is man, man and woman, who were created to rule the world. We have to stress this because it's an obvious fact not stated very much. The purpose of creating Adam and Eve was that they should take charge of the world. Paul was very, very much upset when some of his people in Corinth didn't know this. So he said to them in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, on one occasion, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? <coughs> Have you forgotten that? That don't you know means this is one of the most elementary teachings of the Bible that you seem not to remember. Don't you know that the saints are going to manage the world? Well, I wonder if you listening this morning understand that. We have been so duped and so taken in, so deceived, by a teaching which says that our objective is to go to heaven when we die. The moment we die, we really don't die because we simply come alive again in heaven as a disembodied soul, if you can even imagine that. It's hard to get your mind around that idea. That is fundamentally false. So preachers should be in the business of trying to help people see where they've been taken in, deceived. I remind you, the Bible says the devil is deceiving the entire world. That sounds to me like a pretty much blanket coverage. So the best thing you can say to yourself this morning is, maybe I'm deceived. How do I know I'm not deceived? That's an excellent question. And beginning to ask that question is the beginning of a solution and a correct answer. You remember that Jesus asked questions in his teaching in fact, I just refer to this because we're going to refer to a lot of verses outside John 3 to make our point. But Jesus himself asked them a question after reciting the Shema in Mark 12. Jesus said, now let me ask you a question. Good teachers ask questions which stimulate the mind to examine what they've been taught and maybe to say, my goodness, I have been deceived. Now let me get straight and no longer believe falsehood, but rather believe the truth. Because believing the truth, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.10, is necessary for salvation. So if you don't want to be saved, you say, all right, I'm happy believing error. I'll believe anything they tell me. That would be very unwise, because in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, the verse that I used in my years teaching in the Bible college for years and years, because they did not welcome a love of the truth paul said god gave them over abandoned them if you like to a spirit of confusion so that they would wind up believing things that are false that's a very unfortunate unhappy position to be in so in john 3 16 let's see if you've understood what's said here god loved the world with an all-embracing love and he also then said that he gave his uniquely begotten son. When you read the Bible, you want to ponder every word, make sure you grasp what it means. His uniquely begotten son. Most people really don't know the word, meaning of the word begotten, but that's what that Greek word means. Uniquely begotten. The word beget means to bring into existence, to cause to exist. So this son, Jesus, obviously, was uniquely brought into existence. That's not so hard because that would prove he couldn't exist before he began to exist. So right away, we are going to eradicate the idea that Jesus came from outside the womb of his mother, entered into the womb of his mother, Mary, and was born. That would be impossible on this phrase, uniquely begotten. If you like, don't like the word begotten, it's rather old English, a bit foggy. Let's substitute the word procreated. And we get immediately the correct notion of a creation, a new creation, a new beginning. So this is what then God did. He loved the world that he created, especially the human beings whom he designed should take charge of the world. And we haven't done that very well. So he gave his uniquely procreated. Why was that uniquely? Well, because every other human being, except for Adam, 
had a human father. It's unheard of for a man to come into life, in, into existence, with no human father. So we quickly want to say, Jesus was not just your average man, far from it. He was certainly a man. And if you don't believe in the man, Jesus Christ, you haven't got off the ground in your biblical understanding. Jesus is the unique model of what a man ought to be. And if you say, well, no, he's really God, you've destroyed the entire plan. I mean, the entire point of the Bible is that God gave us a human being who models correctly what every human being should be like. If you say he's really God, you've really removed Jesus from your life. So don't go around saying Jesus is God, because that would meet two gods. And God is hearing what you're thinking and saying. He doesn't want you saying God is two. When he repeatedly, as Carlos just pointed out to you, God repeatedly claims to be one and his unique son was unique in this sense, that he came into existence, meaning, of course, he didn't exist before that. He began to exist in the womb of his mother, Mary. That makes him human, but without the benefit of a human father. That's a stupendous truth. And you could spend the rest of your days in your free time on the Internet persuading people of this. So what else is in this verse here? He gave his uniquely procreated son so that everybody who believes in him should not perish, but have what we have in many translations, not very accurate, but I've got in my translation there, that he should have the life of the age to come. There's a stupendous truth involved in that phrase, the life of the age to come. I used to say to the students, how many words in any piece of prose can you misunderstand before the whole thing is a huge jumble and muddle? And that's the case of many of us who grew up in, in standard churches, in my own case, the Church of England. I didn't know any of this. I think the clergy probably didn't know either, but it's only when I began to think about the meaning of these words that I realized how little I understood. I'm not blaming the clergy, but they're going to have to explain to God why they didn't know that this life of the age to come is the correct translation. The Greek words are Greek speaking people will enjoy hearing this zoe aeonios, which means the life of the age. And the age for all Jews at that time was that future age when all of the world's problems would be finished and over. If that isn't hope, I don't know what would be. Especially relevant is it when I switch on the news today and I see the anarchy, the chaos, the mayhem and confusion, the killing of innocent children, the killing of innocent human beings in the struggle for land. Did you know that the Bible is all about who gets to rule the land? The phrase land and gift of land or giving the land and living in the land occurs multiple times, over 140 times in the Old Testament. It's all about land. So what did we human beings do? We created chaos by saying, no, it's all about going to heaven. It's not. Blessed are the meek, Jesus said, because they're going to inherit the land or the earth. The Hebrew words there, or the Greek equivalents, make no difference. The land is the earth. You learned that way back in Genesis 1. So God wants to give you the land. He wants to give you the earth. That's an extraordinary proposition. He doesn't want you to sit on a pink cloud, so to speak, and play a harp forever. That actually is rather a chilling and boring idea. You would enjoy life much more doing the things that you like to do now rather than sitting there as a disembodied soul. So banish from your vocabulary, banish from your children's understanding any false notion like death means you go to heaven. It doesn't. So what do we do? We then say, well, so-and-so has passed away. 
And we're misleading ourselves when we say that. We're misleading the children who hear us say, nobody's passed away. They've gone to the grave at death. And that's exactly what Jesus said in relation to his friend Lazarus. Lazarus is dead. And Lazarus is asleep. And they thought, well, if he's asleep, that means just normal sleep. He's going to wake up and be healthy. So Jesus said to them plainly, I'm referring to a passage in John 11 there, Lazarus is dead. He's fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. That's resurrection. Not many Bible readers understand that. So I suggest that you try to teach others these truths as you learn them. Then you'll learn them even more effectively. So eternal life, you say, okay, what is that eternal life? The life of the age to come. Well, John's writings are superbly good. Can you imagine we're reading the writings of a man who knew Jesus personally, who was particularly admired by Jesus? Because I think John had this enormous grasp of the truths of scripture and that impressed Jesus so much that this John is known as the apostle whom Jesus loved almost certainly by the way he was a cousin of Jesus if I give you a line from the Bible dictionary in front of me I read this it is reasonably inferred that John the apostle John was younger than James his brother and that their mother was Salome or Salome. And Salome, it is reasonably inferred, according to the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible. And that mother, Salome, was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So this is a cousin of Jesus we're reading about. What sort of person was John? Rather impetuous. He wanted to call down fire and destroy those who were opposing them. He was very strong-willed, strong-minded, and he was given the enormous privilege of writing not only the Gospel of John, but the letters of John, three little letters, which are, in a sense, a corrective of a misunderstanding of John that was beginning to happen even when those books were written. So we're reading today with great privilege and delight the words of this highly ex uh, experienced and highly well taught by Jesus in terms of the truths of scripture. So God did not send his son, we're reading it at 17 there, for the purpose of condemning the world. That's to say it wasn't primarily for that purpose. That was not what God had in mind, not what Jesus had in mind as he went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom, I recommend every time you say gospel for the rest of your life, you say gospel of the kingdom or the gospel about the life of the age to come, which would be the same thing. And everybody understood that in those days. So it wasn't to condemn us that Jesus was sent on his mission of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But what was the purpose of it? There it is. So that with this objective, the world human beings might be saved or rescued. Now, people who don't go to church are missing a major point, or people who don't read their Bibles are missing a great point. The only point of ultimate relevance to you, man or woman, is what's going to happen when you die. Is that the end of it? What if Jesus is the unique person equipped to offer the life of the age to come, life in that future kingdom, which is actually indestructible life. If you go for this goal, indestructible life, you cannot be destroyed forever and ever and ever. If that isn't huge, what would be? So that's the thing to be talking about among ourselves. That's the thing to be engaging our neighbors and friends on the internet. There are thousands of sites out there offering what's called salvation. Well, that word salvation means how not to die forever and ever and ever and ever. Ask them politely, what is salvation? Or better still, what is the gospel? 
It's a very interesting exercise. If they're polite, and most of them are very polite, well-organized, they will answer you. I can almost guarantee you they will not say, well, it's the gospel about the kingdom. And yet Jesus always preached the gospel of the kingdom. Paul always preached the gospel of the kingdom. So another exercise you can try on the internet is to say, what about the kingdom of God in the book of Acts? Because people say, yes, Jesus preached the kingdom, but that was just for Jews. That is a colossal falsehood. Because you'll find in the book of Acts, after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, that Paul was still preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So if you've got a pen or pencil with you, you will want to write down a verse in Acts, Acts 8, 12, which says that when people heard Philip, in this case, he was the evangelist, preaching, what was he preaching about? Being a good chap? No, no. Having good morals? Oh, that's fine. He wasn't preaching that. What was he preaching? If you don't know Acts 8, 12, I'm politely suggesting to you, you haven't really got off the ground in your Bible study. Acts 8, 12 says that when they believed Philip, as he was going on for hours probably, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, and the name would be everything Jesus stands for. Not how to pronounce his name in Hebrew. No, no. Everything about the agenda and the destiny and the intention of Jesus. Everything. Then those people who had heard that preaching from Philip about the kingdom and the name of Jesus in Acts 8, 12, then they were ready to be baptized in water. Would you believe it? You've got people out there saying, well, water, baptism, that's nothing. What? You absolutely cannot risk your life in your neck by refusing such inf easy information. So then if you'll go through the rest of Acts, we won't do it today, but we will go on another occasion through the eight Kingdom of God texts in the book of Acts. If you don't know those today, I say to you respectfully, you really haven't started in your Bible study. So back in John 3, 17, look at this. God did not send his son, his uniquely procreated son. Incidentally, according to Luke 1, 35, that's the verse that will give you that. He sent the Son, commissioned him, so that they would be saved. They wouldn't perish. Do you really want to perish? Who in the audience today says, I really want to perish? Only suicidal people would imagine that. So the object of the Bible study that you're doing, day by day, week by week, is that you don't perish. And what is the alternative to perishing going out of existence is perishing rather you get the life of the age to come and if you're writing notes this morning you'll want to write down the verse in Ephesians 3 24 that's pretty amazing I think Ephesians 3 24 speaks about a reward of an inheritance did you know that God wants to reward you Oh, no, no, I'm not worth a reward. Well, you are. So let's get something clear. It's in Ephesians, I think, if Carl could even find that for us. Uh, Ephesians 3.24, isn't it? You're going to receive a tremendous reward. And it's called... He's finding it for us there with this miracle of the Internet. 24? No? No? I got it wrong. I'm slipping in my memory verses here. That's very bad. Maybe it's Colossians 3.24. Is it? Colossians 3.24? Look for the word inheritance. We're finding it with this miracle of the internet. 3.24. There it is. Knowing. Now you say to yourself, did you know this now? Is this new to you? You are going to receive for your reward... Wow, you're interested in a reward? The inheritance from the Lord. You say, what's the inheritance? The inheritance is inheriting the world, the earth. Jesus said, the meek are going to inherit the world, the earth. 
and you're going to take charge of it. You're going to be responsible for managing that world. That is amazing. I didn't hear that in church. So Bible study is illuminating. If you're willing to say, I'm not sure I've got much of this right. I might not have learned this well. Let me try again. Well, there it is, Colossians 3 and 24. That's a reward. Remember James and John. That's the John that we're talking about. James and John said, what do we get out of this? And his mother also asked the well, their mother, who possibly was Salome. Um, the question and reward is very important. They said, what do we get out of this? We've given up everything for you, Jesus. We left the fishing business. We lost our means of earning a living. What's in it for us? And Jesus did not say, you shouldn't ask for anything for yourself. Don't worry about that. You just get on and be a good disciple. No, no. He didn't say that. Because Jesus was a realist, a real, in a sense, down-to-earth human being with understanding of how human minds work. And so he said, you're going to be kings and rulers and governors in that future kingdom. So there is a reward. There is a point to being a Christian beyond just now, but you don't hear much of that preached in church. Now let's ask again in John 3.16 about eternal life, which you've got now for the rest of your life means the life of the age to come. The art of good Bible study is to turn to other passages where you find the same phrase, because writers will very often use the same phrase with the same meaning. So if you go to John 17, verse 3, Jesus actually was praying here. And when he prayed, he gave extensive sermons. You can hear where his mind is. When he's praying to the Father in John 17, we we'll read in verse 1, he lifted up his eyes towards heaven and he said, Father. That was an address to God. So God is the Father. That's biblical Unitarianism. He's the Father, the only true God. The hour has come, the moment has come. His ministry was at an end. And he says, please glorify your son. That's a human being asking, you might say, even telling God to do something. You're supposed to speak to God. Even in the Lord's Prayer, you say, may your kingdom come. Forgive us our sins. You're telling God, in a sense, what to do. That's right. You're supposed to tell God, remind him. Not that he needs reminding, but we're encouraged to follow the example of Jesus here. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. To glorify someone is to do the ultimate, to cherish their name, to make them famous, to praise them for who they are. Just as you gave him authority over all mankind. What? Jesus knew as he grew up there in Nazareth that God was preparing to give him authority over all human beings. How important is that? Well, Jesus there reminded God of what he'd done. That's a great truth. You, God the Father, gave the Son, Jesus, the procreated Son, authority over all mankind. So that he may grant, there it is, the life of the age to come, badly translated in many of our translations, vaguely translated as eternal life. You gave him, or you will give to Christians, this is the life of the age to come. Here's a definition. That they may know you, Father, and come to know you, or me in the case of Jesus the speaker there, the Son. That's John 17, 3. There you have a perfect definition of the life of the age to come. More on Jesus Christ here. He's not just Jesus. He's Christ. That is a thoroughly Jewish title. You cannot read the Bible without keeping in mind all the time that this is a Jewish book. I've said this often before, if I come to America and say I'm mad about my flat, I'm going to be misunderstood. Over in America, if I'm mad about my flat, you 
picture somebody at the side of the road sweating over changing the tire. I didn't say that at all. I said, I'm excited about my apartment. That's what that would mean in British English. So reading the Bible without first saying to yourself, this is a Jewish book and I'm likely to misunderstand it, unless I remember that. So Jesus Christ is the one there in John 17, 3. This is eternal life. This is the life of the age to come. This is what it means. This is what it entails, that they come to know you, Father, and then he gave you a definition of the Father. And he called that Father the only one who is true God. Did you hear that? Did you understand it? Do you see that's not a Trinitarian definition of God? If you address somebody as the only one who is the true God, your child of two has no difficulty with that. But you go to church and it becomes a big model. I'm not trying to condemn in churches, but I'm suggesting that we need to clarify elementary language. So the object then of the life of the age to come is that we come to know the Father, who is God. He's the only one who is true God. And we also come to know somebody called Jesus Messiah. Messiah is a very highly colored Jewish term, meaning the ruler of the age to come, the ruler of the new world order. And right today in our news, we've got giant and very horrifying human beings trying to expand their empires at the cost of the lives of women and children and men. That's appalling. The kingdom of God, the gospel, is all about who's going to fix this chaos. Who's going to have the power to say to somebody, don't build a tank. If you do, we're going to get rid of you. Don't commit adultery with somebody else's wife. That's out. That's finished. Jesus, then, we can say, is the model man, and he's given, then, as the standard for every human being. By him, we're going to be judged, ultimately. Now, his object was not to come and condemn us. His main object was to save us, to give us immortality and the life of the age to come. But he's nevertheless the standard, the gold standard for every human being. That's rather reasonable. If God would create trillions and trillions of human beings, wouldn't it be reasonable that he gave them a standard? He did. And by that standard, we're going to be assessed and judged. How well we listen to and obey Jesus. That's the whole point. Now, I must tell you then, there's a crime scene going on in John 17, 3. A fellow by the name of Augustine, or Augustine, I think, in America, Augustine in England, he didn't like that verse. Would you believe it? There are theologians who hate the words of Jesus. What? Yes. They're trained to get rid of the words of Jesus, and Augustine was one of them. He said, oh, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't sound like the Trinity. It sounds like God is the only father and the only one is true god augustine hated that because his tradition had taught himself something different so he said okay this verse really should read i'm quoting now from augustine to shock you with the appalling crime scene that we're looking at here augustine said this should read this is eternal life life they should come that part stood that's fine that they should come to know you the father and the Son, as the only true God. Did they teach you that in church? I hope that you are appalled by that corruption, that complete hijacking of the text at a very important point. Jesus is giving a base, basic definition who God is, who Christ is, and the life of the age to come. Augustine got rid of that. So the Bible has been attacked by famous names. That's why Jesus said constantly, he warned, watch out, beware of fake preaching because it's leading you in the wrong direction. So you should then seriously consider the words of Jesus that you may be surrounded 
by people who are lying to you, not intentionally, but they have uncritically accepted a whole lot of, lot of very untrue things. One of them, then, is the idea that God is three rather than one. So that's the lesson we get out of John 17, 3, a key verse defining the life of the age to come. Back in John 3 now, we would verse 17. God did not send. I should comment on the word send. You see, some of you are hearing that means that Jesus was alive before he was born, and then God sent him into the world. No, no, no. All the prophets were sent. It simply means commissioned. That is easy to find. You'll find that John the Baptist came from God too. It doesn't mean John the Baptist was alive in heaven before he was born. No, no. He was commissioned. So you have to learn, quote, the language of the Bible. I don't mean you have to learn Greek and Hebrew, although it's fun to do that too if you've got that sort of a mind for languages. But you must understand that this is not an American or British book. So God sent his son. Jesus came into the world. But this, the result of that was overall a tragedy because we read there in verse 18 about people who didn't believe in him. God did not send his world, his son into the world, didn't commission him, that's to say, to judge or to condemn the world, but that the world might be given indestructible life forever and ever and ever and ever. Verse 18, he who believes in him, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Oh, I believe in Jesus. No, no, that's not clear. You cannot believe in Jesus if you don't understand that that means you must believe in the teaching of Jesus. So make that then one of the things that you are reinforced with this week. Believing in Jesus means believing in what Jesus said. And to show that, I could show with several verses in John that that is true. But if you go for a moment over to John 12, at the end of John 12, you have this wonderful statement. I'm going to read John 12, 44 now as commentary by John on John. John 12, 44. Please note what Jesus did here. He cried out. It's not recorded that Jesus raised his voice. He didn't shout when he preached generally. But so emphatic was this statement. Jesus cried out. For your notes, you'll find he did the same thing in Luke 8.8. 8. I won't turn there for time reasons. But Luke 8.8, 8, in the parable of the sower, he yelled. Why? Because he wanted to underline about 15 times in red ink. And in John 12, 44, Jesus cried out with these words. He who believes in me does not believe in me. What? Actually, that's a very clever way to teach. It gets people's attention. He who believes in me doesn't believe in me, but in the one who commissioned me. That's the same as saying, I and the Father are one. It means that we're not one person. That's just silly. Everybody knows a father is not the same person as his son. That's just nonsense. Everybody knows that. What it means is that we're working in perfect harmony. Every word that Jesus spoke is the word or words of the father who gave those words to Jesus so Jesus is the perfect human representative, ambassador, agent of his sponsor, who is the Father. This is one of the great truths that John had learned from Jesus. So the one who believes in me, Jesus said, doesn't ultimately believe in me. Of course, he believes in him too. But he doesn't ultimately, in the depth of all the truth that's to be found in the first but you believe in Jesus, you're believing in the one God. The Father who gave the words to Jesus said, wonderful. He's the agent. So what happens then? Let's see. In verse 45, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have to tell you the word see in John's gospel 
often has the sense of understanding, not just seeing physically, but understanding with the mind. My mother used to tell me, and it's funny how when you get to be my age, you remember what your mother said, but she said to me, the blind man, how did that go, Barbara? The blind man, is, I see, said the blind man who couldn't see at all. That's a good way of seeing the word see can mean physically seeing and can mean understanding. So if you've understood Jesus, you've understood the Father, not literally seen the Father. So the word see, you'll find by examining the use of that word, often means understanding. 45, he who sees me, Jesus, sees the one who sent me. There are two there, but there's only one true God. So don't turn around and say, well, those are both God. The universe is shattered if you say that. The Father is the only one who is true God. We just read it. Then in 46, I have come. That word come is very straightforward. It means I've arrived on the human scene. I'm here. In his case, born supernaturally, begotten supernaturally in the womb of his mother Mary coming into existence, procreated, and I've now come. I've showed up on the human scene. For what purpose? Let's see what it is. I've come as a light into the world. You're supposed to think of Genesis 1 here. The whole ministry of Jesus is a repeat, if you like, of what, Jesus, what God did in Genesis chapter 1. That's wonderfully clear. The light came into the world. Jesus is the ultimate light. So he's a rehashing, if you like, a copying of the whole Genesis episode, the new creation. That's wonderful. Um, so let's finish this verse and then we'll, we'll get to the points there. I've come as light, light into the world. That's to say, I've showed up on the human scene, I am the light of the world. You better sh take note of Jesus because he's the light of the world. So that everyone who believes in me and my teachings, that's implied there, will have the light and not remain in darkness. Okay. Uh, well, got some. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, I was going to ask you about the light here. Yeah. In verse 19. Hmm. So we can compare that to John 1.10, uh, yes. where John identifies the light coming into the world, mm -hmm. which is which was synonymous, by the way, with the Word of God. Yes. Uh, the light and the Word of God are synonymous there. Yes. Uh, just have a question here for mm. you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. I did have a question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Bert, uh, if you see there on the screen, yes, is the better translation of the Greek "whosoever believes like him" instead of "whosoever believes in him." With that understanding, believers follow a pattern of faith in life, like Jesus did. Well, it's the same thing. If you believe, it's a clarification. If you want to say "whoever believes like Jesus believed," that clarifies even more vividly what believing in. By the way, the King James Version, believing on, forget about that. You don't know child today or any adult talks about believing on somebody. So the King James creates a sort of fog over your mind. Don't want that. Use a modern translation. The New American Standard Version would be adequate. There are many good versions, like the Revised Version, RSV. So to believe in is exactly right. It means you to believe what Jesus believed. So let me put it this way. The devil only has one major trick. That is to get you to believe in Jesus, so-called, without believing his teaching. The teaching of Jesus is everything because many have been taught that the teaching of Jesus was really only for Jews. That is absolutely false. Let's say it plainly. You, are, you must be believing as that correspondent of ours that says, believing like Jesus, believing as Jesus believed. And if you want to put in your notes there, you're going to write 1 Timothy 6, 3, 
1 Timothy 6, 3, says, if anybody comes to you, now be warned, if anybody is preaching to you and not bringing the teachings of Jesus, 1 Timothy 6, 3, watch out, you're being scammed. And people say, well, these are theological differences. Yes, but what you believe is who you are. So you want to struggle for the truth at all costs, 1 Timothy 6, 3. And then John in 2 John 7, 9, these apostles were smart people. They knew what was coming. They wrote with error in mind so as to correct it. 2 John 7 to 9 says, you must believe in what Jesus taught. So that correspondent there is right, exactly. Follow the teachings of Jesus. Don't ever say, that the gospel is just that Jesus died and rose. That's half the gospel. That's another subject, but it's very, very good comment. Yes, why not? Yeah, thank you. Um, mm. Just want to make a comment on the God sent his son into the world. Yes. Uh, there's a quote here I'd like to share, if you don't mind, from the theological dictionary of the New Testament. And you can find here, you can find this quote under the heading of the cosmos, uh, the world, in volume three. To come into the world is used in the Talmud of certain persons, for example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or of men generally who come into the world, that is, men, all who come into the world. It's always used of events. Punishment comes into the world and of things, something which has not come into the world, that is, which does not exist. Corresponding phrases to go out of the world to die are to leave the world. In such phrases, cosmos, world, is mostly used without emphasis to denote the theater of human life. When it's said that man is born into the world or that we bring nothing into the world, 1 Timothy 6, 7, or when death is called departing out of the world. Such expressions have no specific cosmological or theological content. So this is a, if you will, a Hebrew idiom, a, a way of speaking for the Bible that should not be taken in what they call, Anthony, a cosmological yes uh, way i thought that was that might help Very, our viewers exactly right so departure from the world means dying coming into the world means being born jesus was born he is the ideal model of what a human being is supposed to be and therefore he is the judge of the world he is the standard jesus actually condemns us if we don't repent, because he's the standard. And if we haven't lived by his judgmental standard, we fail. We are to follow the example of Jesus, which means following his words and teachings, as I just finished reading to you in John 12, 44. I hope you keep that one in mind always, because that is a sort of summary statement of every point we're making here. John 12, 44. I didn't perhaps... Finish reading it there. Let's go back to John 12, 44 to make our point finally. He cried out, I've come as light, just as God created the bodies of light, the moon and the sun. So Jesus is that light, spiritually speaking, so that everybody who believes as he believes will not remain in darkness. Now 47. If anyone hears my saying, ah, if anybody is exposed to my sayings, not just that I died on the cross, although, of course, that's essential as well, and does not keep them, I don't judge him. I personally am not going to do the judging there. But the word that I spoke, the gospel of the kingdom and everything else I taught, that's the standard, because Jesus is the standard, and his words are the index of his mind. If you believe in the words of Jesus, you're believing in Jesus, because that's what he is. 
your mind being the source of your words. So the word that I spoke, all the words that we read this morning, are now standing in judgment over every human being when the time for judgment comes at the last day. God is going to say, how well did this per person measure up to the standard that I, God, sent in my son? Then he clarifies it even further in 49. Look at this. I did not speak. My teachings were not on my own initiative. I didn't make them up. But the Father, who is the only true God, as we learned earlier, who commissioned me, has given me a commandment, not just a, a saying to be ignored, but every word he spoke was a command. He gave me a command, the Father did, in regard to what I should say and what I should speak. And I know, Jesus said, that the Father, who is the only true God, you'll remember, that his commandment means is the life of the age to come. You've got that now. It means you get immortality rather than being destroyed. And there's no such thing in the Bible as eternal torment. The wicked are going to be destroyed, put to an end. So if you want eternal life, there it is. We had it in John 17, 3. Here it is again in John 12, 50. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father told me. Isn't that simple? Isn't that beautiful? So if anybody comes and tells you, well, the teaching of Jesus, that's for Jews, that doesn't count, you're being lied to. You're being confused. So get hold of this lesson from Jesus here, that the words that he spoke, his teachings, his sayings, are spirit and life. In fact, we could add that to your notes this morning, John 6, 63. Building one text on another, John 6, 63, we have this. It is the spirit which gives life. You're dead without spirit, in other words. The flesh, that's to say, the person without spirit, doesn't get you anywhere, profits nothing. Now look at this in 6, 63. The words that I, Jesus, have spoken to you are spirit they're the essence of what it means to be spiritual is to have the words and then as a result the life of jesus so i remember a korean student of ours in the college was really taken by that verse and made it a kind of slogan for the rest of his ministry john 6 63 the words how precious then are the words of jesus they're incomparably precious because they lead to life and spirit now. And if you believe them and practice them, you avoid being uh, consumed, perishing, being put out of existence in what Jesus called Gehenna fire, the lake of fire, which doesn't exist yet, but it will exist at the second coming. Does anybody want to perish? I would hardly think so. Then the only solution is to pay close attention to the word and words of Jesus, which are the word and words of God himself. Okay. All right. Thank you, Anthony. We'll stop there. We've run out of time, so we'll have to do a part three to chapter three, apropos, I guess. Uh, so we'll end that on, we'll pick up on 322, I believe we are, chapter three. Uh, verse 22. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, watching and listening. Uh, we have some comments. Uh, we read through the weeks and months, uh, mostly comments from YouTube and uh, some from email like this one. It says, uh, great live stream as usual. I thought I might be your greatest fan that actually gets excited on what you guys are doing might be the only fan no just kidding yes i will keep saying that i have always in my life had esteemed influential teachers professors or an, on an academic level but i must say that anthony inspires me the most right now i'm soaking in like a sponge on what he says and you that is me carlos and tracy are also just excellent 
I mean that. Um, it takes a lot to get me excited theologically, laugh out loud, LOL. Thank you so much for that email. Very nice of you. And this is another comment from uh, YouTube. So we get many comments on YouTube. And uh, thank you, beautiful Barbara, for bringing to our attention the importance to listen. Without listening, we cannot hear the truth. So we are we are kept in bondage here. The truth sets us free. Psalm 124, verse 7. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Yeah, it's, it's a poetic language. Not that we have a soul, by the way. So thank you. And that was on Learn to Listen from Barbara, one of her youth lessons. Are you fit for kingdom of God service video? Thank you. I now understand this verse clearly. And that's Luke 9.62. So if you want to look that up in your spare time, thank you for that very nice comment. On another comment on Barbara's Learn to Listen, what a simple truth explained in a simple way. Thank you very much, Barbara. Regards from England. <clears throat> okay, and um, I had a debate, one of my many debates with uh, Matt Slick, the founder of an organization called CARM, C-A-R-M. I love how you expose uh, Matt Slick. They put Mark there. <laughs> he is so disrespectful how he debates, oozes zero patience and passive aggressiveness. <laughs> yes, well... Another debate I had uh, with, I think this was the last debate with Colin Green, an author in uh, the UK. Excellent debate, Carlos. Your answers were simple yet powerful and to the point always pointing to what is written. The Trinity folks are always dancing around the text using human reasoning. Well, that's all we can use really, human reasoning. <laughs> what is non-human reason? Anyway. If we understand that God is one individual, Jesus, his only begotten son, and the Holy Spirit, his power, influential force, then he, the scriptures open up. Thank you, Ramon, for that comment. Uh, another one, uh, uh, many on this uh, debate. Good point. So interesting that there are no theophanies that are multi-personal. Love the short clip. So yes, this was a clip I made from the debate where I ask uh, Mr. Slick why theophanies are unipersonal in, uh, in the Bible. So that's a weird thing if God is three persons. All right, well, thanks for watching once again. Uh, please, uh, once again, keeping your prayers, uh, our friends, our brothers and sisters in uh, Russia and Ukraine, Maxim, keep your prayer in your prayers, Tracy, as she uh, does ministry, continues to do there in that area of the world. We pray for anyone who is going through any illnesses, uh, the pandemic as, as we keep going through this. And uh, we always uh, pray, obviously, for the kingdom to come. So. Father, we thank you for this time, the technology. Thank you to Anthony for the longevity, the long years you have blessed him with, and many more. To Barbara and uh, Michelle and Tracy, Sarah with the youth lessons. And to our viewers out there, thank you for watching. And may they be blessed by the teaching of the Messiah, the teaching about being born from above. and obeying uh, you to get baptized, Jesus, as you yourself got baptized. Um, we pray uh, until next week, and uh, we, again, pray for peace in this dark world. And uh, for those less fortunate than us during this time, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone until we meet again.